We all sometimes want to go back to the 80s, to the heyday of action movies. It was the time when the grass was greener, and the brutality of the main characters was measured by the width of the shoulders, the speed of the feet, and the stretched t-shirt. When the good ones were clearly good, the bad ones stood out with a suspicious appearance. Today, in About Movies, we will remember some remarkable old-school action movies of the 80s, the 90s, and the fate of their main characters. What kind of production hell can a film get into due to incompetent producers? How did Jean-Claude Van Damme steal a role right from under the nose of Chuck Norris? What action films does Bill Murray like to rewatch? Let's go! Hasta la vista, baby. In the 80s, actor Tim Matheson came up with the idea to shoot a remake of the Japanese film Zatoichi Challenged. He was a big fan of it. At that time, Matheson starred mainly in minor roles. For example, there is Animal House and 1941 among his works. But he really wanted to try his hand at producing, so he turned to an old friend, screenwriter Charles Carner, for help. He decided to set up a meeting between Matheson and producer Daniel Grodnick. Daniel agreed to cooperate on the condition that he would be given a worthwhile idea. And so, work on the film Blind Fury began. In fact, the creators took the Japanese film and the entire series of original novels about Satsuichi and the Wandering Blind Swordmaster as a basis. The idea was fixed and adapted to the viewer, realizing that it would be more interesting for the average American to watch the movie about a countryman, a veteran, than a Japanese samurai. Grodnik sold the script to Jeff Zagansky, president of TriStar Pictures, offering two advertising slogans, he doesn't need a dog, and pray to see him before he hears you. On the American posters for the film, they chose something between he may be blind, but he doesn't need a dog. <laughs> nice doggy. The script was rewritten 11 times until they received the studio boss's approval. The film was directed by Philip Noyce, who gained some popularity after Dead Calm. But everything, of course, did not go well. Many famous actors didn't accept the offer for the lead role, and the film's budget was getting lower. As a result, the authors decided to invite a recognizable face, but not so famous. Rumors said Philip Noyce did not want to offer the lead role to major action stars, pursuing the dream of filming something original. So, Rutger Hauer, who showed great promise after participating in the fantastic action film Blade Runner, got the lead role. The actor's training for the shooting was intensive. He took saber training for several months. In addition, he consulted with a blind man to get used to the role. But it was not enough. During the filming, Hauer began to be criticized by his colleague Sho Kosugi, who believed that the actor was not skillfully swinging a sword. From that moment on, Hauer spent all his free time training with Kosugi. In an interview, the actor admitted that he began to lose weight because he had to work out for several hours a day. Blind Fury was one of the most difficult jobs for me because of the combination with the sword play. I'm glad it does not show. I mean, that was so difficult. I trained every morning at 4.30 before shooting for those seven weeks. Sho Kusugi was brought in for the sword play. That was an additional shoot for a week or so. Test screenings were excellent since the audience met the film very well. So the TriStar Pictures studio was so inspired that it began to develop scripts for the trilogy filming. The problem started in post-production. There was too much blood and sweat, so they did not want to give it a standard adult rating. They had to cut some scenes, but some moments were censored. The advertising campaign for the film was also not particularly successful. It also came out at a not-so-successful time. It had to compete for audience attention with films like Blue Steel with Jamie Lee Curtis and a new Steven Seagal film. The latter, at that time, confidently occupied a special place in the hearts of action fans. Critics were not unanimous in their opinion. Someone scolded the film for numerous blunders, cliches, and a naive plot. But the famous critics Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel, on the contrary, gave the film two thumbs up, which was considered a sign of quality. Reviewer Ian Jane of DVD Talk praised the lead actor's performance, writing, Howard does a commendable job in the lead and is reasonably convincing as a blind man. Unfortunately, with a $10 million budget, Blind Fury grossed only $3 million. The studio gave up on continuing the story. However, in those days, the viewer had something to see in the cinema even without a sequel to Blind Fury. Write in the comments the name of your favorite action movies of your childhood or youth. Steven Seagal, as mentioned above, was quite popular in the 90s. So, in the 90th year, he worked on three works at once. Hard to Kill, Marked for Death, and Now for Justice. 
The first two films were released at once, and Out for Justice saw the world in 1991. Hard to Kill became the second film in his career after the success of the police action movie Above the Law. It did not assume anything radically new. Seagal appeared there as a tough policeman, a moralist who deftly swings his legs and fights for justice. But it surpassed the success of the first one and brought the actor to a new level in the niche of action movies. The viewer first saw the famous ponytail of the actor. Initially, Hard to Kill had a different name, Seven Year Storm, and the film's advertising campaign was held under that name. But before the release of the thriller, Warner Brothers decided that such an option would not work. After all, it should be immediately clear by the name that a powerful action movie is in front of the viewer and not something else. Wouldn't you like little pussy, JD? Just a little bitty pussy. Look what I've got here. She's sweet. Seagal influenced the production of the film. In addition to participating in the script and staging of action scenes, he also influenced the choice of director. So he chose Craig Baxley, who made a name for himself thanks to the works of Dark Angel and Action Jackson. But Baxley was not eager to work with the actor. The director later stated that the reason for his refusal lay in the fact that he did not like Seagal. At a certain point, many interesting and not-so-interesting facts came out about the actor. Some of them were bullying stuntmen and allegations of sexual harassment and domestic violence against his then-girlfriend Kelly LeBrock. Kurt Russell also gave Seagal a negative assessment, noting his rude and aggressive behavior on the set. However, at the time of Hard to Kill release, nobody noted that, and Seagal gradually occupied a significant niche among the stars of action films. As a result, Seagal had to work with another director, Bruce Malmuth, whom the studio literally forced to work with the actor. Both of them were not happy and often quarreled among themselves. Seagal would later speak very negatively about Malmuth, considering him mediocre. At the same time, he talked publicly, discussing in an interview the intellectual abilities of the director and giving them an unambiguous assessment. I think it's a miracle that this guy can put one foot in front of the other. It was rumored that the reason for such a dislike of Seagal to Malmuth was that the director hurt the actor's ego, not allowing him to edit and not particularly considering his opinion on this issue. The actor did not like the director's fight scenes. The lead female role was played by Kelly LeBrock, the same long-suffering passion of the actor. By the time of filming, Kelly rarely filmed and agreed because of Seagal's request. As a result, reviews from critics were mixed. The ambitions of the studio played a cruel joke on the film. Several important moments were cut out of the film, wanting to make it more dynamic. For example, cutting out of the storyline with the kidnapping of the protagonist's son deprived the film of a dramatic component. As a result, the super action film became shorter by 30 minutes, which upset Seagal, who believed that the edit spoiled the film. However, Hard to Kill was a box office success. Starting from first place, it got $60 million, with an expense of $11 million. Until we move on to the next film, which was less successful at the box office, we suggest you click on the subscribe button and the bell to learn even more amazing facts about the cinema world. Subscribe, and let's keep going. The movie Sniper 1993 did not fall into production hell, but there were some difficulties with filming. It all started with a shuffling of the directors of the film. At first, Barry Levinson was very interested in the script, but soon left the project since he could not persuade the producers to increase the budget. The next was the Peruvian director, Luis Losa, who already had fire on Amazon and the experience of filming in the jungle. He had his view of the production raised on American films. He was critical of contemporary action films, calling them prosaic, cartoonish, and antiseptic. That is why Loso wanted to add realism to the film and to bring back a sense of impact to killing. The plot was based on the story of Carlos Hathcock, a U.S. Marine Corps sniper, and his duel with the South Vietnamese National Liberation Sniper. But as usual, there's not much left of the original story in the plot, even though the announcement claimed otherwise. It was done to attract the viewer and look more solid. On the set, the actors were allowed to improvise. Thus, the film received many jokes that were not written in the script, which remained in the final version. So, in the glasses scene, Billy Zane had to say, as you please. Instead, another option got into film. May you go blind. During the advertising campaign, the producers decided to experiment. The film was positioned as a killer action film in the American segment. Accordingly, the trailer was filled exclusively with action scenes. In Europe, Sniper was presented as a psychological thriller about the confrontation between the two main characters. According to the box office results, it turned out that the bet on action gave the best result. 
So they collected $19 million in the USA and only $3 million in Europe. Everything was not clear with the budget of the film. According to the web, information diverged in the range from $8 to $12 million, but the box office did not particularly please the studio. Critics' scores were mixed, so on Rotten Tomatoes, the film earned only 4.7 out of 10. Variety called it an expertly directed yet ultimately unsatisfying psychological thriller that is, undermined by underdeveloped characters and pedestrian dialogue. And soon, sequels appeared. They were already issued on cassette, and if you still can watch the second and third parts, the rest of the films went downhill. Billy Zane and Tom Berenger also left the project soon after, though not for long. In the 2000s, they returned to the franchise to earn at least something, when the careers of both repeated the fate of the sniper. Kickboxer is the luckiest film on our list. Its premiere was in 1989 and Jean-Claude Van Damme participated in its development. He wrote the script and corrected it during filming. The film was directed by Marc Dassault. Initially, Chuck Norris was considered for the lead role, and at the beginning of work on the film, the script was written for him. But then the studio decided that the Belgian was a better and more promising option. And they were right. Van Damme worked hard for Kickboxer, brought suggestions to the film, and staged all the fight scenes. So the episode with meat and training was allegedly taken from the actor's personal experience who, according to him, was trained by his coach, Claude Goetz. The latter often attracted his German shepherd to harden the body and spirit of the future star. It was a good dog. It never bit on the face, only on the arms and legs. I rarely managed to escape from it and had to fight with it. There were other, no less severe methods of training. Much of what my teacher made me do, I reflected in the film Kickboxer. The Thai boxing school that the hero attends is also real. It was a practice center with about 50 kickboxers living in it. I want Dan, and I want you to teach me Muay Thai. Really? But you are American. So? Americans have swelled heads, especially when hanging upside down for too long. For a long time, they could not find an antagonist. Mikhail Kisi came in handy here. He was a consultant and director of fights, and after, he tried his hand at acting. After working out the script under the direction of Francois, the character Tong Po appeared in the film. Although Mikhail and Van Damme played antagonists in the film, in real life, they have been good friends since childhood, often exchanging fighting techniques, were sparring partners, and dreamed of becoming actors in Hollywood. After working on Kickboxer, they worked together on other projects such as Lionheart, and Bloodsport. Kickboxer recouped a $2 million budget, earning $50 million. It came in second place in its first week of release, behind only Uncle Buck. Studio Canon, of course, decided to film a sequel, but it did not have enough money for the lead actor. All because the studio used to sell its rights to the released pictures, and no one initially expected a miracle from Kickboxer, because the studio did not demand lots of money from the reseller. As a result, Canon received only $5 million from the box office. The rest of proceeds went to those who bought the rights to release the film. The second kickboxer appeared without Van Damme. The actor turned down the role, but offered his services as a script consultant. The film, of course, failed, earning only $1.5 million. But for the Belgian, film was a good start for a future career, earning him a worthy place among the action movie actors. And his character's dance in an Asian bar under the influence of local booze turned out to be so popular that it turned into a meme. Later, on a show with Conan O'Brien, the actor repeated it, but he did not dare to do the splits. Roadhouse, directed by Rowdy Harrington and starring Patrick Swayze, received the most negative criticism on our list. It was included in the top 100 worst films, according to Golden Raspberry. The production cost $15 million. Part of the reason was the rather high fee of Patrick Swayze, who became very popular after Dirty Dancing. The actor refused other projects, Tango and Cash and Predator 2, to participate in the film. At the same time, he could act in the latter, but did not want to. He argued his decision by the fact that participation in the Roadhouse almost made him disabled, and he definitely won't survive another action movie. The actor performed most of the tricks on his own, training under the guidance of Benny Urquidez. Testing his kung fu skills on the court, Swayze suffered two broken ribs and injured his knee. The episode with Marshall Teague was filmed for five days, during which both actors tried to fight as realistically as possible, and therefore they hit each other with their legs and arms for real. Then both went to the hospital. Benny Urquidez recalled, Hits to the face were picture shots. 
not real hits. But the body shots, kicking Patrick to the tree, that's a thrust kick. Those were solid hits. Real hits. Likewise, when Jimmy picks up a nearby fallen log in the scene and launches it at Dalton, both the log and its impact were real. Such experiments led to an increase in the shooting time and budget of the film. Later in an interview, Swayze admitted that the film became the leader in the number of injuries in his career. That is why he was afraid that shooting in Predator 2 would finally put an end to his health. But Swayze's kung fu wasn't the only problem. What made filming more difficult was the crowd of Patrick's fans who ran after him all over the set. Filming had to be stopped due to excessive fan activity. But the film's problems didn't end there. The test show failed since the audience did not appreciate Swayze in a new role. Because of that, the film was pretty cut. If initially it went for more than three hours, then the final version lasted one hour and 54 minutes. As a result, part of the fights and even some characters were cut out. There were problems with the advertising campaign. The studio promoted the film as a light and comedic movie for Swayze fans. In fact, the film was quite cruel, with a lot of swearing. What's the matter, you chicken dick? What are you afraid of, me? <laughs> that it, Dalton? You scared to fight me? You big, bad Dalton. What do you want, to kiss and make up? Roadhouse grossed $62 million at the box office on a budget of $15 million. Among the audience, it received a good rating of 6.6 .6 out of 10. But the film was negatively received by critics. Entered the list of 100 worst films in the history of Hollywood according to the creator of the Golden Raspberry Anti-Award and received four Golden Raspberry nominations. The main complaint was related to the script, which the studio heavily reworked to suit their plans to lure crowds of women into cinemas. As a result, the film did not have any clear direction. Too violent for Swayze fans, too pop for fans of furious action movies. Despite the critics, Roadhouse still collects a huge audience and has excellent viewing ratings on American TV. And among the cold action movies, the film takes pride of its place. In 2006, a sequel without Swayze was released. The actor read the script and immediately refused. That is why the budget was cut, the script was changed, and released immediately on cassettes. Many famous actors like Roadhouse. For example, Bill Murray lauded the film as unappreciated with a complex plot and respect among actors in the film industry since its release. Kelly Lynch, who played one of the lead roles, confirms Murray's love for this film. Every time Roadhouse is on and he, Murray, or one of his idiot brothers are watching TV, and they're always watching TV, one of them calls my husband and says, Kelly's having sex with Patrick Swayze right now. They're doing it. He's throwing her against the rocks. As you can see, many modern films have become the golden ticket for the main actors, and even those that did not receive critical acclaim or a fabulous box office remain classics of the genre among action films. In some ways, naive and bearded, they still gather a lot of viewers in front of the screens. They are about justice, kindness, and about the fact that the good guys always win over the bad guys. We talk about the career of one of these good guys in our other video. How did Chuck Norris go from martial artist to actor? What is his favorite movie? And what about the Chuck Norris facts? Click on the video that appears on your screen and find out everything. It was about movies. Like this video and stay with us. More interesting things are further.